Great. Well, welcome to the virtual Agile meetup. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's really great to be able to see you and see familiar faces as well. Uh, I'm super excited about today's session, um, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, but before we get started, just to say really thank you so much for coming um, today, whether it's your morning, noon, evening, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, who knows. Um, it's just really great to see you and for you to spend time with us. Um, we're going to be running for around about um, around about an hour, something like that, maybe a little bit over. Um, if you need to ask questions at any stage, you can either pop it in the chat, but you're also very welcome just to unmute yourself. Um, I think, uh, yeah, everybody's able to unmute themselves, so that's good. So you can do that. Um, we're also recording the session, but you know that because we've just started the recording. Um, but yeah, don't be shy. This is really just a fire, as, as it says in the, the, the promo, a fireside chat uh, with Ty. So do come with uh, lots of questions and insights. If you've been here before, you'll know that I am a massive fan of rock, paper, scissors. Um, it's a great tool, actually. I use it a lot with teams, a lot in training, a lot in different kind of circumstance because you can make decisions and you can hear like a lot of voices just by playing rock, paper, scissors, as well as the fact that it's just a great game. Um, and usually, like universally, it's, it's known, I think. So that's also helpful. So have a common language. Um, so you up for a game? Yes. Oh, Definitely. Yeah, okay, good. I like the <laughs> audience participation, so it's nice to know. Cool. So show me your best rock. Beautiful. Paper. Oh. That was great, Don. And in this went free, very floaty paper. And lastly, this is whether you're having a good good day, good days like this, bad days like this. But your scissor. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So first question is, I'll ask the question, you respond with a rock, paper or a scissor. Paper might be difficult or with bad memory, but the first question is, it's my first time here this evening. Oh, quite a few returners, excellent. Um, second question is, who believes that culture drives a change in behaviors? Ooh. Or do behaviours drive a change in culture? Yeah, that wasn't the second question. I just yeah, made that up. Thank you. Um, and the third question, who's fed up of hearing culture change and agility together? And uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've written this really funny, this question. Oh, but that culture and agility is not actually a thing. I've had to kind of make that up, so it's a bit of a weird question, but we'll go with, we'll go with it. We'll go with it. Um, anyway, moving on from that, thank you for playing rock, paper, scissors. And as I said, we uh, we've got an amazing guest here today, um, Ty Crockett. Uh, have I pronounced your surname well? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Like excellent. Excellent. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited, to, both of us are really excited here to have Ty here today, is because. I saw Ty, quite, I don't know, maybe three years ago or something like that. And you were on the Scrum Alliance coaching journey um, with Sherry Sa uh, Silas. And uh, Sherry basically was, it was talking to you and getting insight into, you know, a diversity side, side of things and trying to understand a little bit more about what it is, you know, to be a, um, a, a coach or be in an agile environment and an agile coach culture. And one thing that you called out was around how, you know, diversity is obviously around um, skills as well as many other things. And it was the first time, really, that somebody had brought that to my attention. I'm a strong believer in that as well. So we were talking just before this session of, you know, I often talk to everyone in the organisation. I don't necessarily see the utmost importance of going straight to the, the CEO, but to talk to your receptionist, to talk to the people who serve you with food, to talk to people who actually make it an environment that's, you know, healthy to be in. You've got to talk to these people because essentially everybody is of equal value and everybody's idea is 
is welcomed. Um, and I loved love that about you. Anyway, so enough of me blabbing on. Uh, introducing uh, Ty to the conversation now. And yeah, talk to us more about how you got involved with the uh, Cherie's program, Coaching Alliance program. Yeah, I think, um, uh, one, it's really amazing to be here and be a part of uh, this group today. So thank you for having me here. Um, I think with uh, with getting, like how I end up getting into uh, into that talk uh, with Sheree, which was also like a like a kind of a chat um, with about uh, between us about this particular subject. Um, I had led a team of uh, of enterprise coaches at this really big organization, um, and Sheree was one of the uh, people inside the inside the inside the team, and um, when when I showed up, I remember um, struggling with like, well, okay, so what's wrong? What's 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 the issue for me to be here? Um, and um, I feel like the content that ended up coming out inside of uh, the talk with Cherie and being invited to it was me displaying some survival mechanisms. Um, I I feel like I am very much a um, a big example of my personality type and my uh, my way of focusing on problems, my person, my uh, the dynamics of how I interact with humans, and that alone is definitely not going to save the day or to, or carry the day. Um, what I did learn through that, because I feel like a lot of that was like learning uh, when that happened, and is definitely stories and and. Um, things that I took with me for future um, activities I might have gotten into. Uh, what I did end up learning was what I had alone was not going to make it. And there were so many amazing people that I ended up working with. So we kind of leveraged that as we bring in new people into our group. I remember there was a time period where I had this kind of thing that I would do where I go and I explain to them, I'm like, hey, here's this person. And they meet them and we kind of have a small chat. But then I, as we'd walk away, I'd be like, okay, for that person, they are your go-to for X, Y, and Z. We talk about what their skills might be or something like that. I'm like, yeah. And if, you know, and then we talk about like, we talk about the hard skill set. We talk about the emotional skill set and like what, what all they could go and lean people onto. And I remember like people who'd be coming in, they'd be like, thank you. I've never been introduced to a group and then understood how to go and connect in with them. Um, and in doing so, it kind of made me inventory in my head. What am I saying uh, it is about these people, which resonated with something I think is really true across um, how I look at people, which is every human is is really interesting to me. I don't, I don't think I've ever met a non-interesting human. I'll hear people talk about that as a thing, but everyone that I've met has just been really interesting. And I think taking the time and being very deliberate about finding out what that is and what, what those pieces are has been really helpful. But because we end up building this team where we could identify where we had gaps. So whenever it was the next time for a hire, we were like, hey, we're struggling in this space. We would like to hire somebody who will support us there. And so even the interview would pivot a little bit as we were looking for people who could help us like be a bit more whole. Um, we, I, I would always say that we have everything that we need to, uh, to, to make it, but it was just ways of like, man, we could, we could improve on that and we could learn from somebody who might come and add something to us. And so in building those, in building teams like that, that was a really, um, a really big learning thing. And uh, for how I ended up getting on the show with Cherie, I think we kind of connected really strongly over that because she went off, off to go build teams and we use those learnings from that spot. I went off to go build teams and work with teams and kind of learning from those spots. So I would say that's kind of how we went from like A to Z uh, on the on in that particular situation. That's what got me um in the spot where I started to talk to her about it there mm. so I, I mean I'll, I'll open up for questions in a minute for um for others so I just am a bit curious myself of you know you've obviously got a very curious way of thinking a curious mindset or you know and that's quite a good good thing to have right as a coach um and as a trainer actually yes. uh, 
I'm wondering how do you um when you're speaking to people are there sort of tips that you have to be like oh actually I can really see this strength because in some people it's it's pretty obvious um Mm -hmm. but in some people not so much so yeah um this is one that I think goes a bit counter to uh to something I learned it when we started doing um we start doing like these, I've always been into like, uh, I, I, I just call them like all kinds of personality dynamics. If I look at my bookshelf, the agile and scrum piece is like this much, but the human behavior and um, personality dynamics, um, all types of books on like, uh, that, that end up having an assessment associated with but books on how people behave. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what or I have a ton of stuff at. And one of the things I've noticed whenever we would take these assessments, I'm like a freak for these things. I mean, like throw in a personality assessment for me, I'm like, boom. It's And I, I'm like always surprised. It told me what I told it to tell me. Like, I'm so surprised. <laughs> but, so, but, but I would see some of my peers be like, oh, you're not that way. Like, I, I know what you said, but like, you're, that's not you. And I was, and I would always think, I'm like, yeah, but man, that's who they're trying to become. So therefore, why don't we support that? But listening to them in, through whatever means they were giving me, you know, everybody communicates in very different ways. Some people are going to come up and be like, I have a, I have a friend that I uh, met from Spain and she's like, oh, at the first, she's like, I think there's something really important that you need to know about me. And it's right off when she meets you. And she's like, I hate onions. Like, I don't want to see them around me. I don't want them to be near. Like, if you bring them to me, we have an issue. And I'm like, oh, that's really good that she, like, just tells you right off. Like, life is kind of centered around this this aversion to onions. Um, <laughs> but everybody doesn't just come up and let you know. Uh, there's mm-hmm. very different ways that people might communicate this to you. And some people were communicating who they were, or at least who they were becoming, through maybe this assessment kind of thing. And so being able to kind of like listen to people in whatever way they're trying to communicate to you is really huge, which gets me into like working on something that I consider a skill, which is how do I improve my emotional intelligence and how do I improve my ability to listen? And Mm -hmm. so uh, in the coaching space, we're all into this, but I think it's not just something that's reserved for us in the coaching space. Like it helps across all professions and, in work styles. So like listening to people when they're trying to tell you who they are. And it, I think there's little bitty nuanced things that happen, but that was one for me. That was a really big one. We would go do this. and People would be like, Oh, I am, you know, I'm a sparkly bubbly behavior and nobody else can see that, but I'm like, Oh, so they're looking for opportunities and how do we create them, which created stronger team bonds because we provided those opportunities and made it safe for them to exist as they wanted right mm. yeah <laughs> I just, and i saw how does she make a spanish omelet thank you because i am going to definitely take that to her and i'll be like oh i think your whole thing is messed up because how do you do this <laughs> you're gonna be opening up a can of worms you got no idea the do you put onions or you do not <laughs> put onions? yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's really, yeah, no, that's really interesting to hear. And uh, well, I was going to ask a question, but I'm going to open it up to the floor, actually. Has anybody got a curious mind, curious thought, want to know more? We had one in terms of um, when you are working across as a team of coaches, um, which sort of approach do you take in terms of consistency or how how do you manage that same voice? Oh yeah. Okay. So um, we had a lot of things that we ended up developing over time and this is across multiple teams of coaches, but some things that I think were really core and things that I kind of take with me to other places. Cause I, I want to give each place or each endeavor the opportunity to be its unique ecosystem but some things that I feel that like but I'm gonna I'm gonna add this to it right off the top was um we found time to meet between ourselves to one offer up things that we thought would improve us we pulled in um 
voices from outside of our space. Um, we and and by that I mean like we had some people who were doing a type of coaching that we were not familiar with. They were just doing like life coaching somewhere else with executives somewhere, and so we invite them, and then we would invite. Um, people who did sales in our markets to explain to us how they read people because they do, they're really good at this, right? Mm -hmm. um, we started understanding how to understand the big picture of what people were wanting and needing from marketing uh, executives. Um, and then um, when it was a long time ago, one of, the, one of our early teams, um, there was a time period where we needed to be explained, uh, explained to the coaches because we were We'd all, we were all very experienced. So there was a, well, like a big age difference between us and some of the people we work with. Um, social media. Because <laughs> there was like this, okay, so you think this, this was one of, one of the people's statements, you think this and you just decide to put it out into the world like everybody wants to hear it. And so, <laughs> and like today, that's like not even weird, but back then that was kind of strange. And so we had somebody who was, uh, who was a lot, closer to the beginnings of social media as as a use across uh, across the world and she would she was kind of explaining like why this was happening and how it could use it and like so that was really nice so that was a um a thing that we did to kind of kind of stay together it was form that and we would do it every every week or two weeks um we would kind of talk about where our skills and who we could partner with um, so we work in technology a lot. Pair programming was a really, had a really big push at the time. And so we were like, well, can we do this thing? Which I, I would think Cherie would call it like tandem coaching. Like how are we mm -hmm. pairing up and partnering up as coaches, right? Um, so we were, we would do that, especially if somebody had this thing that was a super strength that you didn't feel was so great inside your own skill set. Like how do we start to partner up? And we would even like, self-identify like how 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 strong do you feel with this okay so now we can be very purposeful and have intent around how do we grow inside the space i'm going to go with you and go do this thing you'll observe me while i do this thing like those kind of behaviors those are some of the ones that i think we really took um took on then there were some ones that were like specific areas um we did like strengths finder um, and we talked about what do we look like? And we started looking at it, like take a step back and look at the group as a whole. Like what is what what are themes that are prominently showing up? What are things that are not? Um, we did it with DISC and some other ones. Um, there's some times where that was just like really amazing because it talked about people's behaviors and tendencies. Um, there were some parts where I felt that maybe it was risk. Um, we got into some risky spaces because we started to box people in. I'll use myself as an example. Um, I am um, a super extrovert. I love talking and do all this kind of stuff. But and when I would take down an item to say, I'm, I wanna go work on this, um, some of my partner coaches would be like, no, you're probably not the person for that because you're not a very analytical and blah, blah, blah person. So we would, we would have those kind of instances and um, I ended up on the really good side of it, but I felt like maybe some of my coaches were very, uh, my coach peers were very limited because they're like, no, you're not really great with talking to people. So maybe you shouldn't do that presentation in, everybody, in front of everybody. I'm like, no, 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 this is not what we want to mm -hmm. be the working. And so we had to have some kind of conversations around that. But if those tools type of things can be used to be tendencies, around behavior as opposed to uh, boxes of how you exclusively act around behavior. Fantastic and beautiful because these are spaces for diversity, right? So I think that is, those are some ones that I think I would take with me every time, but I think each place deserves the respect of kind of building what it is. There was a question, I, I wanna go back to this. There was a question that you uh, asked around culture um, there's a developer, his name is Tim Rayburn, and he made this statement that is something he got from somebody else too. Culture is the behavior that your organization allows. And that re has resonated with me like to this day, because if it could be that you have this amazing kind of thing, but you keep allowing this other thing, 
and that momentum and weight and gravity starts to swing your culture over to something else. And all of a sudden it's not what you thought it was anymore. And, um, and that could be good or that could be, you know, kind of a bad thing. And so we would notice those kind of things. So every place deserves its own, I don't know, um, ceremonies, rites, uh, whatever it is that you guys end up putting together that makes it you. Mm. It's, it's an interesting point on the culture because I, um, in my experience from over the years, it's, you know, you can have great cultures and to build a great culture, it can take some time um, because it's, you know, your behaviors are triggered by your thoughts, by triggered by lots of different things, aren't they? So you're really getting into kind of the human brain, I suppose, but for a culture to turn, um, to turn into something that perhaps is less helpful for people to thrive, that can almost happen very quickly. Um, it, which I always find quite interesting that you, you know, that to go from swinging from, you know, the left to the right or the right to the left or whatever, um, def definitely has a different, well, I feel has a different momentum, you know. Um, well, it was a question, but just a thought, really. <laughs> I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think that like an event, especially a, an unfortunate event, can have us do this pullback and entrench behavior that will get us into some of the bad spaces around that. Um, our behaviors become ones that are, they're so self-protecting, If even if it's the ecosystem or the individual, uh, they become so self-protecting that it might cause harm to others. And that's really easy and fast to get to. And this may be a statement that's just about a small ecosystem like our workspace or a really large ecosystem like our uh, the places where we live in our communities. Um, and so that thing can happen and it can happen super fast. Um, but that intentional, thoughtful caring of other for others and, and trying to make sure that is pervasive and then setting up structures and systems to support that culture that exists is really big. One of the things that like I think I learned from some of those places where I worked was we would be called in to do very tactical, mechanical things. Like, I will teach you Scrum. Like, that's a, yeah, I, I know that now. Like, okay, I have a new skill set. That's kind of cool. But then people would witness success or whatever from it. So that individual would have this experience that started to, like, change that individual's mindset. Mm -hmm. And um, so we would say like, okay, if enough people have this mindset shift, then this becomes a change in culture, like a critical mass of people who are thinking and behaving differently is the culture that exists inside that place. Now, um, at that point, we have this new culture that we deal with. And I always think of an organization and leaders have some, some, decisions to make your structures that are in place likely supported the culture that did past tense exist the question is do you change your structures and infrastructure or whatever the case may be to support the culture that is now if and if it's a good thing fantastic would are you going to support that if not um, then i believe either the people who make up that culture will choose to be a place where that, that does support it or the culture will end up reverting back because the structures are kind of like a tide of, of a river. I mean, it's constantly there. It's gravity, right? It's not changing. There's nothing to, that, 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 that causes it to stop. And, you know, at a certain point in time, the individuals get tired or worn down. And so they decide to do something else or not. Yeah. Right? But, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I suppose it's like any, sort of habit isn't it in a sense if you you know you do something over and over again but there's always that you know whatever it is chocolate bar in the fridge that you're like oh it's just there if you keep leaving the chocolate bar in the fridge you're probably always going to go back to it and have a little nibble um, rather than go out for a run or I don't know that's my only example <laughs> um, you had chocolate in the fridge <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we didn't let you know Justin sorry <laughs> um yeah yeah it, it, again so I've seen in the chat as well Dustin you're saying you really love the the, the coaching what the pair coaching model this tandem idea um yeah I, I love that too I think it's great 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind kind of mentioning that. Like, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I've done that with developers where we we teach paired programming. But when I've gone into an engagement and I've had another coach that I can work with, it it's so nice because I find myself going back and forth between the mode of uh, trying to understand and and trying to be understood. And when when I'm trying to be understood, I might be thinking more about the message that I'm sharing. And there may be things that I am missing, whereas the other person is able to read from that and to have that, you know, that trustful relationship where you don't have the fear and people can give each other uh, some positive feedback. I found it to be so beneficial in building up both people and the product that we were delivering um, to the client was so much better. Um, I, I also will shut up briefly, but um, I I met Tim Rayburn about 20 years ago. I was at a conference in Austin and have talked with him on and off and and agree, a uh, fabulous, fabulous individual. I, I, yeah, he has been a, a dear friend for a while. And um, I, I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount from him, especially those like instances where I can like, I can remember the moment, you know, that thing was said, I'm like, oh, you know, so yeah. Yeah. I, uh, on the, on the, like the pair coaching, cause I mean, that's a version of this. It's just a really scaled down version of this. So I'm at a, pl I always think about this, like you're at a place and it, it feels like it's just you. It probably doesn't need to be, it could probably be you and somebody else, uh, you and somebody who helps, whatever that may be. Um, but even if it's just like the, the two, um, I've just had these opportunities that have been really amazing. There's a, another uh, person who's been doing this uh, with me from when I got started, her name is Allison Pollard. And she um, was pairing with me on, with a, with a team that I was working with. And I thought I had like, I had seen everything and I, but I, you know, my vision is kind of limited by like the lens that I'm putting around it. And I put some really rose colored glasses on sometimes. And so, um, so she, she identified that I was kind of like pushing all of this content on the team uh, that I was working with. And she's like, so what have you done? We're all together, by the way. And she's like, what have you done around this particular problem that we're talking about? And I'm like, oh, me? <laughs> like, how can, how can I do something? I'm the coach. <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, right. And we ended up going into like, oh, there's some spaces where I could have been helping and I could have been more active around it. And I thought that was something I would have never seen had she not been there with her lens, right? And I think that was really, really amazing. We've maintained this relationship of like pairing um, over, man, uh, over over a decade. And um and so we can always kind of come back together, have our little adjustment moment, and then fall back into our rhythm. There is uh, something just recently, she gifted me a course uh, called Alchemy. Um, and it's about like paired facilitation and, and it gets a bit into coaching, but a lot of paired facilitation and a lot of ORSC content. And I thought that was really useful and, and inspiring for uh, kind of getting into this. And I think there's a lot of space that tries to put that in into place. But I think that same content, that same I, those same ideas can be used to expand out to a larger team because it's just scaling that model of us together as the two. Yeah, you know, you, you touched on the feedback being positive and I can imagine any, any conversation with you, Ty, even if you're giving positive or negative feedback is probably a delight anyway. But how how is that how is that uh, not just received but in terms of supporting people receiving information that may not be what they expected? So you know the example that you just gave of oh I didn't see that in myself I actually thought I was doing a pretty good job like how how do you relay that in a way that is welcomed or, or do you find it's never never really welcomed? No, I think there's. Um... I think there's ways of doing this. This is this is kind of a funny one. I I get asked to do like the rejections and stuff for people because <laughs> when you say it, they don't get mad at all. As a matter of fact, they're excited to go learn the next thing. But when I say it, then they're like, oh, why were you treating me so bad? The world is a bad place. And so I think, um, you know, and I, I put it to a couple of pieces. One, I think language really does matter. 
um, the way that we say something is a part of it. What we say is also really, really important. Um, so a really awesome thing about giving people feedback is if you can understand a bit more about the person, you know, in doing that, if you have that that good fortune to be able to understand them a bit more, you can frame things for them that'll give them the ability to like receive it in a better state. Um, not knowing anything about somebody and giving them some harsh feedback may backfire um, or create entrenchment or something like that, right? Um, and I think I've been, I'm gonna say this is another piece where I've been fortunate because that's very situational. Like what if you're in a spot where you have to give somebody feedback, but you don't have those connections and understanding. So that's a really hard one, but I think I'm, uh, I've been gentle in my way of doing it, but sometimes people don't need gentle. And so this goes back to the, how do you create an entire group that kind of supports each other in this space? Um, I remember when I first understood radical candor I was like, ew, like, it sounds like you're being mean to people. But then it's actually something I prefer. I, I'm like, oh, for me, I always want straight, straight feedback. I want it kind of hard. I want it to be very blunt. And, uh, but I was like, but I would never do that to somebody. <laughs> and then one of my friends, of course, is like, but you want it for yourself. Like, what are we even talking about here? And so um, starting to understand, I may not be the right person that you need in this moment, I think is, is part of it. And man, those pairs, which I think we end up calling them like dynamic duos or something like that. Like the, those, those kind of help out even amongst the big team of coaches or of whoever you have together. Um, we find that, you know, people tend towards pairs, they, they'll do that. So even within the team, there's some like duos um, that end up happening, or I don't know what you call three. <laughs> Try <laughs> trios. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can I can imagine like somebody watching this and being like, oh great, you know what? We'll send out a survey to see how people want to get their feedback. Yes. Do you think there's this genuine idea of so literally saying to your colleagues, to your team, and having that discussion of, you know what, guys. I really love direct feedback, but yes. conscious you might not. Yeah, I I think that's that's huge. Uh, depends on the size of the group because I'm like, okay, I can't remember. Does that person like? <laughs> um, and I think it takes a little bit of time, but I I would like that's like a start working on yesterday behavior to me, like understanding how that works, especially if we're in a a entire profession that is all around improvement, then how do we, you know, how we, how we make that happen and how we, how we want that to receive that, that's super important. I, I would almost say it's just as marketing goes out and understands the pulse of the market and what the needs are, this is a behavior we should be doing. Just as sales in turn says, hey, I want to get you to shift to something else, this other place, and I want you to receive this, then people need to be able to receive it in a way that's good for them. And so, so asking them is such a simple way to get great inroads into the, the human, right? Yeah, yeah it's uh, ironically, sometimes can be the hardest thing to ask, can't it? <laughs> Which mm -hmm. is funny, I think. Um, Dustin, go ahead if you want to chat out your question. Yeah, I don't want to, to dominate this, but um, Ty, a lot of the things that you were talking about are the things that you want and then things that you were sharing with others. Um, and, and radical candor is quite interesting because the message can be quite harsh um, as, as long as the intent is there. Uh, you know, with kind messaging, hopefully it comes across well. But that line between inflicting uh it seems to be uh, all the difference, and I was kind of curious what your or your experiences or your thoughts are on that that dichotomy of sharing versus inflicting, or where the lines are drawn for you. Yeah, dude, that that you use the same language that I do in that because um, I I say oftentimes we can we can inflict the things that we do on other people, or I would say we inflicted ourselves upon them. Like like this is almost like a consistent state for us um, sometimes. When I first started getting into um, professional coaching, uh, I started hearing 
things that I struggled with. I'm like, look, we're not therapists. So we probably shouldn't be touching that area. We're also, um, we are not these, um, you know, like uh, uh, magically wise people. So everything that we think is not necessarily true. Um, and I am a very big believer in people asking for this, for these type of feedback. Um, I do believe there is a line that exists in an organization. This is something I forgot to bring up earlier. Um, it's about um, uh, the type of obligations you might have. So I have an obligation to the human who I am interacting with. Um, I also have an obligation to the organization that has paid me to come in and do a thing. And those two might co conflict. Um, I can replace the word with confidences and it's the same thing. It's the same true, right? Um, I do believe there's a spot where my obligation that I have made to the organization says, hey, even if you haven't asked for this, I need to let you know this thing because now, you know, I have, it's these, these things are in conflict. And I would talk about that too. Talk about like, hey, this is a situation. Here's the conflict area. I need to let you know this because we have reached an inflection point between my obligation to the organization and the things that I am seeing between you and, and that. Or something is happening between us, uh, like you and I as an individual, and I am starting to feel that hurt or pain or whatever it is to a certain extent that I need to let you know and give you feedback, even if you haven't asked for it, because this is causing some type of hurt or harm to me. Um, so those are spaces where I was like, hey, under any circumstance or under most circumstances, I'm going to go ahead and give you feedback. But otherwise, I think it's a spot where it's asked for. I do believe you can make an offer. Um, and I think there are, there are ways to make the offer that can make it like, it's not really an offer. You must take this, um, which I don't like that one. <laughs> but I think you can make an offer and then, but it needs to be like a genuine way that allows people to opt out without like tremendous guilt or something like that. Cause that's not really an offer. That's like a threat, you know? Um, and so, yeah, the concept of sharing versus inflicting, like sharing is usually the the thing that like is asked for or it's a offer received um the inflicting is going to be in the space of didn't want and you did this anyway um and so i i struggle with that and i struggle with that in this space because i believe there are a lot of people who have uh, to me to be what does it mean to be a coach like i called myself one and therefore it's true um there's nothing that stops that from happening and so there is a, a space for us to go and I think do do some harm to other humans. And that's like, to me, one of our biggest goals is to do the opposite of that thing. So uh, that's kind of where I sit on the, on the space. I'm human, I'm going to make some mistakes and not putting yourself on some pedestal during these types of conversations, I think is really big too. Yeah. Yeah, so on the on the topic of coaches in organizations, a question came up um, uh, a little bit earlier um, around what are your sort of thoughts and views around coaching in organizations, coaches being removed now from organizations and it's not being necessarily the thing to do? Um, uh, ooh, this is a <laughs> this is one that I I feel like has been um, I think it's been happening for a little bit. It's kind of been building up towards this, um, and it's one that when I first got into in I'm going to be very specific and say when I first got into Scrum, um, I was warned, and they're like, "Oh, don't do this," because I was I was an IT manager and I slid into Scrum, and they're like, "Don't do this." The project managers are the first people that they fire. And I was like, but I, like, and I, I learned enough about it. I'm like, I don't think it's actually a project manager. Um, I learned Scrum from like a Wikipedia page when Wiki was very new. And um, and so, but I, but that's kind of been in my head ever since. Like what happens when this wave has passed? Uh, like this isn't the thing anymore. 
And uh, later on, coaching became a a thing. There were no coaches, I guess, early on there because Agile wasn't a, a thing that was known a, a lot. Um, and so I've always kind of wondered about that. Even today, uh, being, being in consulting, I get to kind of see what that looks like across a really wide area, at least. I would say for me in the in the states, um, Mexico, Canada, and so I um, I see over time, and for my friends who are people who, are, who hire for this, they're saying like, what is the value of these people um, that do this type of job? And it is lessened over time because perception, at least, it's lessened over time. We are pulling these skills in and the things that we we would teach or would offer people as coaches, people are internalizing and it's becoming something that, you know, the communities understands the words that we use. They understand the things that we're trying to get. Like agile is not the fresh new thing that's like, oh, that's a surprising way to work. Um, so I don't think it's got the same impact because people are starting to know this. People who are younger and um, in a, uh, much much newer generation I don't like whenever I'm like even teaching courses I'm a professional scrum trainer whenever I'm teaching courses around that or around any subject related um, and I teach like at a college it is the only time that I can end a class early because they're like oh yeah that makes sense how else would you do that and I'm like well there's all this stuff all this dysfunction that I've learned by being inside organizations for a while and they're like oh well, that doesn't make very much sense. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. It's right. So I do think there's something around the, the information and the thing that we've been trying to do being kind of spread out and disseminated, which is good. I mean, that's a, that's something that we've wanted to have for happen for another time, a long time. And this is my personal belief. And I believe it may be controversial that if this is something that you have historically done, we need to start thinking about how do we help one, if you've been in the technology space doing this for a while in other, in other spaces, two, how do you start transitioning it? It's not just teaching this thing and how we begin. It is about how do we incorporate this into everyday operational behavior? That's our value that I think we're, we're, we have the opportunity in uh, today is like, think about what operations look like. It was the whole purpose of us getting started in this anyway is helping people be operationally better. Um, but I think we focused a lot on on start, getting started startup, which is amazing. It's good. That's the hard part, right? Uh, the operational stuff is where we need a tremendous amount of focus now. So maybe if we can kind of pivot ourselves to be helpful there, um, and maybe the coaches, and this is going to be a controversial one too, maybe the coaches start becoming more of a, a, a part of the organization and team members uh, than a distant um, observational person. I don't think that's the way we should have been playing in all the time anyway, but I see us oftentimes looking over, drop some wisdom, I'll come back again later if you use my wisdom or whatever. And I don't know that that's, that was necessarily the thing that we should have ever, ever been. It was not the original intent, at least. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I've had exactly that conversation this week of let's yes. stop observing and start sort of integrating. Yeah, there's still helpful conversations. You don't need to best friend everybody, but, you know, you can be, be this person. Observer is... I I do feel is a, a sort of a strange word, but Adrian, you've got your hand up. Go for it. Okay, just trying to complement what uh, try, what uh, Ty said, and I'm still thinking that uh, in the '60s and '70s, the people doesn't care about to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist because they don't know the real value to do that. They've been, he's sick, he's missing something, but when you try to get help from a specialist, it's because you try to change the things. You try to change your way, your path, where you're moving in, into the time. And, and this is the same with the coach in, 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 in into a organization. For instance, the resistance because the value of the coach provides is not 
reflected in the value of the product or the product by itself. So why would we need it? Is because we are doing something wrong? Probably no. Probably we are trying to start talking from from the from the way that I don't know what this professional is doing here. But once that we have this professional and the impact of his work is projecting into the time, is completely different. Yes. Now, now that we have an a, a an specialist for in that way, in that way, the next thing is to try to don't put it into the pedestal because he does a magic, he's not a magical uh, entity for saying in a way that has a one that is going to change everything. What we have to, to do is move it closer to the people. The, the big conflict is you don't know operation because you're a coach and you never lead a team. Yes. Well, probably could be the case, but it's not all the cases. I think that the in, in the way that we kill, uh, destroy the pedestal, and move back the coach into more horizontal conversation with the team, that should be great for all. Yes. And at every tier, I mean, I understand that there's like enterprise coaches, like, cool, go be with the enterprise people. Um, it's still, you can still, wherever you're connecting with that, whenever I look at coaches, um, I end up thinking there's people who like kind of specialize in working with some teams, which I consider like a, kind of a horizontal um, or, um, grouping inside the organization. I think of uh, like skills-based, like tech coaches, technical coaches or something like that, that has like a vertical concern all the way up up the organization of to like, hey, what's our grand strategy for what we're going to do with this technology? Um, I think of those enterprise coaches as another horizontal concern at a high level of the organization, integrating all of these different pieces or helping for those pieces to be integrated. And every single one of those, like we can go be, more involved um, in, in touching a bit more because our people, if they get the concepts, then now how do we, how can we throw in an ad to help? And so it's just a, a an amount of involvement, I think. And I think people are kind of wise to the amount. There is so much out there. Um, I went to a class and now I'm, I'm a coach or I now I'm an enterprise coach. And so now the people are becoming wiser buyers or subscribers um to what we do and so they're not going to take they're not going to take the poor quality content um because they can recognize what that looks like so i get the change mm. Mm. and often it's a bit like a tidal wave isn't it if you think about um you know uh the whole twitter scenario of everybody getting let go and then you know it was salesforce and it was another company and then it was another company it's all has this tide wave and actually we need to ask the question i think even as coaches anybody within the organization doesn't matter to say is this really necessary why are we actually doing this um is it because it's a new fad you know we all go out and buy iphones i don't know or is it because it's something that we actually need to do i mean can you imagine if every you know everybody started buying toilet roll at a rapid pace suddenly all the organizations do it as well it just wouldn't make sense um yeah. so i don't know why we have a sort of this you know one person said it on twitter or on linkedin or whatever it is and therefore it's an, an actual thing um yeah yeah it's interesting isn't it you'd mentioned twitter earlier and you were sort of talking with your colleague about isn't it funny how if you want to say something you just kind of say it um <laughs> and I wonder how we feel comfortable in just putting things out into the world wide web, the www, as my neighbor says. Um, and yet we have, we struggle with more human conversations. Um, I'm always curious about that and how, you know, you can come across people with, you know, maybe fairly shy in life, but a very, very big personality online. Um, how, yeah, have you come across that? Or what, what are your sort of thoughts around? Yeah, and I and I think um, even in, back into that pulling that into the team scenario, absolutely, and 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 sometimes that's a strength. Um, I have met people like when it's in a bad space, I always call it like, oh no, they got their internet courage up, you know? They're like, well, <laughs> yeah. crazy things, but in front of you, like, not really, buddy. I'm kind of cool. I don't know what you're talking about. And so um, I think of I think of what that looks like and um I've met some of my some of my team members who were like they are so amazing and eloquent but if I were to put them 
in the boardroom to go deliver that content directly, they would kind of stumble over the words. And I think that just might be like the nervousness or, um, or I think of there's like a, when, whenever I was thinking like the introvert extrovert axis, I always could make sure to consider the shy or bold. Um, so I've met like a, these people who are like really bold um, and they do well in those situations. Some of the people who are really shy, but man, those amazing ideas. So I do a lot to make sure that in my everyday interactions, the people who are working with, with on these teams, they have the space for contemplatives to be able to get their ideas and voices out there. And so, yes, man, eloquent, beautiful, thoughtful, just needed some time. And it was worth the wait, right? Mm -hmm. um, and where me, I'll go ahead and issue an opinion on something, whether I have skills or knowledge or background on that thing or not. And like, that might not be the right path for us to walk down. Let's take a break. Let's take a minute. Let's, th let's think about this. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I've been recently talking um, uh, talking about things of having this one hour of boredom uh, with organisations at conferences and things. And it's like, imagine if we all had that one hour of boredom or even that time to think in order to respond to a question rather than everybody just be like, oh, oh, yeah, oh I just want to get in. I just want to say my thing. Then what a different world we'd live in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this would go into that, like we were talking about listening earlier. Um, I remember when I took Lisa Atkins' course on coaching and then the pro the coactive version, uh, um, it was active listening in that spot where I'm just waiting for the moment when I can see a spot where I can talk and then boom, and it was like we're in that level one active listening space where I'm just waiting for my spot. Like I can kind of hear your words and maybe listen to it a little bit, but really opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well I know that we're sort of starting to come to the top of the hour and it's coming to lunchtime for you and it's a uh, different time today for everybody else so that are there any other sort of questions that people are sort of burning to ask Ty whilst we're here any other that I've missed in the chat thank you Dustin No, so as a coach, obviously this wise coach that we've put on a pedestal, what are your last words of wisdom? <laughs> um, one of the things like, like, so one of the things you said for me when uh, about, about the attraction to what I was saying was about <laughs> these different types of diversity. I think we've talked about a few of them, but I, in, in, in prepping to come and talk about this, I thought about, okay, so what are the areas that I would say were important for me to say were, where diversity sat? Um, of course, um, the ones that have become obvious for us is like gender. And then um, I've kind of split a few up and, th and there's some ones that we shouldn't miss. There are ones that are like, okay, we shouldn't like, we shouldn't use them to eliminate, but we should definitely not miss them. Um, and this is like where we start getting into like um, race or getting, uh, getting, booting somebody out because of the religion or group that they operate in. So there's, those are like a, that's like a special set for me. Um, and then, but then I start talking about like the ones that I think people don't think about enough, like experience. It is not just great to have a team of like absolute immense veterans um, in your group. Like there has to be learning in this curiosity and growth from uh, an early space that I think if you can find ways to work that in or make the investment there, <clears throat> personalities. Um, that's a weird one because judging what that is, is kind of weird. But I think oftentimes my solution around that is like, what do people self-identify as? And that probably is a good, good space. Um, of course, skill sets. Like, I feel like this is one of the things that I loved about Scrum really early was the, a Scrum team had to have all the skill sets to get the job done. And I think that's the same thing for us as coaches. Do we have all the skill sets to address the environment in which we live? Um, personality, maybe introversion, extroversion is a kind of a space with that, because I feel like you get a whole team of one type, then you start to, you start to bias how, how you engage your group and organization, uh, cultural identity, ethnicity, I think are, those are two spaces that I think are important that we, that we probably don't touch enough. 
um, what your background looks like, what location you're currently in. I think those are those are some spaces. Where your origin is, um, I can get a lot of the same in some of the places where I go. Um, and then what are your strengths? I think that's, I don't know if we talk enough about that. Like we do all, often look for gaps, but what are our strengths? Um, and then gender identity. I think that has been a space, especially if we're in technology, that has been, um, there's a big preponderance of like one representation. And I think we could probably use the rest of humanity to make ourselves a bit better um, and grow a little bit more. So I think of those as some spaces just to consider as you're going out and uh, thinking about, do we have a diverse team? Like, okay, so what are all these aspects? And um, I, I saw something maybe it was a couple of years ago, the concept of uh, intersectionality where every time one of these things touch, the complexity level rises to by an enormous amount. It doesn't just double, it's like, it's a multiplicative of what that looks like. So trying to make sure that you have a diverse team, there's no there's no end to that space. Um, we can be really, really different and that can be our strength. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if adding to that sort of that list of things that you've just spoken about is around where sort of creativity and different modes of creativity comes into that and in terms of, you know, have you got people who who are more image orientated, more visual, or, or people who love music and actually thinking about how something's played, could could that help us design something differently? I don't know, things like that as well. Yeah. Yes, that's so true. And even like um, morning people and not like I like the creativity thing really resonated with me. I put in the chat VARC because um, I think of those. How do you learn like different mm. ways of absorbing and learning, which probably makes us better at understanding other people who you're going to go help in their learning styles because we're, we're offering uh, what we have to them. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, it's really, I don't, I don't we said we started to wrap up, but it's interesting. So I think if you think of VARC, you think of, you know, just documentation that we do with, dare I say, um, documentation, but like that, that we do within our teams, whether you're a scrum team, whatever team you're doing, like, does it have to all be written? Like, what kind of people are going to be reading this? We need to think di diversely about that as well. Like, do, does everything have to be, you know, three pages of writing no it could be something visual or maybe we could you know do a quick TED talk type thing or maybe we could do I don't know there's so many other things to it, so many other levels um but we automatically go down this road so I hope yeah I love it yeah yeah good food for thought well Thank you so much, uh, Ty, for spending, you know, the last hour with us. It's been so wonderful to meet you. Um, and yeah, it's really, really good uh, to have a chat with you. And yeah, that's pretty much takes us to the end of this session. Uh, we, As always, just to give everybody a bit of a hint, uh, Ines has uh, just put a feedback form. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about feedback today, um, but we only run these because people find them helpful um so if there's anybody you would like to hear from or if there's any topic particularly you'd like to hear Ty, if you've got somebody you'd recommend to come on uh the virtual meetup then it would be lovely to hear that as well um yeah that's it thank you thank you so much thank you so much Ty, and uh thank you everyone good morning good evening and good night <laughs>